Hey, what's up, y'all? It's Cracking This Day Boss. Reacting to this video by Jasper Lang. This is Hot Ones Guest Impressed by Sean Evans Questions. Um, so we're gonna see what questions he's asking that's really impressing them. I don't think I've heard him ask any of the guests anything that was like really thought provoking or cool. Um, so I don't know what they're referring to. We're about to see. Let's watch. This is my favorite show. My favorite area. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. They're really like a compilation of you getting compliments, by the way. If you ever need an ego boost, it's on YouTube. <laughs> well, some, you know what? And sometimes I do. And sometimes I do. So I know that you guys have a love for sports that goes far beyond just sitting courtside at the Staples Center. Nick, I'm curious, when you spent a week in spring training with the Dodgers back in 2010, is there a story that stands out? Yeah, they didn't want to. <laughs> you didn't make the team? Um, yeah, that was amazing. So funny, not a lot of people know that. Uh, I did that. I'm um, so excited that you just asked that question. I'm so excited. <laughs> I can see you just, just lit up. Hangover's gone. So as we mentioned in your intro, you have a Netflix special that's streaming now. But yeah. I'm curious, when you first moved from Nebraska to California to chase that dream, mm -hmm. what level of success seemed realistic to you? Like, what would be your minimum accomplishment for you to feel like, oh, wow, I made it? That's cool. I don't know if I've ever answered that question. I, I feel like I had, like, delusions of grandeur. I'm like... If I'm not at a Will Smith level of fame in three years, I'll husk corn for the rest of my life. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I just started to chip away at it, and I realized, like, you can just sort of mini-climb your way up. Yeah, it's like uh, level I was like, oh, I could just, like, do comedy clubs and be a headliner and, like, be a guy that is the, the guy for the weekend. I would probably be happy with that. So I know that your journey to Comedy Central wasn't easy and that you went through multiple iterations before Workaholics took on its form, but can you tell the people about the instruments of destruction? Oh my god! <laughs> what? Sean, where'd you even find that info? Dang, deep cuts! You trying to be like um, war. The instruments of destruction was me and Blake's sketch group prior to, um... Mail order. Mail over comedy and workaholics, and we just had the most bizarre sketches imaginable. It's a big transition for a kid, say, from New York to go to a small liberal arts college in the Midwest, but I imagine the culture shock must have been very intense showing up in rural Iowa to go to Grinnell, fresh off the plane from Karachi and Pakistan. What was the best thing about living in Iowa, and then what was the worst thing about living in Iowa? Oh, wow, good question. The best thing about living in Iowa was I'd come from like a very, very intense, like I came from Karachi, which was like, you know, like New York, it's 20 million people. Uh, you know, there weren't many Pakistani Indian people where I was, so I still felt like, I just felt a little bit special. So the best part of it was that it wasn't really populated. The worst part was that it wasn't really populated. Yeah, I know it. By year three, you're like, all right, I need, <laughs> I need to go somewhere else. Loved Iowa, it was great, but at the end of four years, very, very, very ready to move to a big city. What is the one question that you get asked most often that you hate answering? You're welcome. Good luck and Godspeed. Um, it's got to be, what does Babish mean? Because uh, I have answered it a billion times, and we'll answer it, we'll answer it here, hopefully. For I'll do it. I'll do it for you. You hate answering it. You know what we know where He's that is from? A niche character from the West Wing. You're absolutely right. How many episodes of the West Wing? Three. Eight. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> when you knock someone out, is it just a pure thrill of victory feeling, or is there a part of you that's, like, concerned for the other person? Uh, that's a great question because in my training, the concern lives in sparring. When you hit someone really hard that. in sparring, you're concerned for them, you know, because they're concerned for you. They're letting you know when they hit you that I got you, keep your arm up, keep your ribs covered or whatever. But when you're in a fight situation, and I did not know this, I've never been a professional fighter until that moment, there is no concern for each other. He came out to take my head off mm. and uh, he fell. I was 43 at the time, like this guy was way younger than me, he was going to beat me, but I wasn't having that. So, there's no room for concern, is a short answer, you just have to go in there and it's like man against man. You know? Just to be older, you know? So in a 2010 New York Times profile, you talked about being really fascinated old. by the career of somebody like Daniel Day-Lewis, who's able to have this viable, huge career in acting while simultaneously maintaining a private life. Uh -huh. And since that time, we've gotten further away from that version of a movie star. Do you have any thoughts on how celebrity is handled in the media? Like, do you still yearn for that sense of privacy? 
That's a great question because, you know, my career spans over a couple of decades. I was talking to a publicist about this, you know, how the trends have changed. You get, you know, we want to know more. We want to know more. We want to do, we don't just want to do an interview. We want to eat hot wings with you. You know, we want to, and uh, that is a sign of the times. My personality in real life is probably way more disappointing than my characters that I get to play. I play way more interesting characters than who I am in real life. However, that said, I don't miss the days where you could be mysterious. I don't actually miss that. I watch Gordon yeah. Ramsay, I watch Shaq, and those guys were sweating bullets and cussing and raising all kinds of hell. So for me to be able to wing this, no pun intended, have a wonderful sit-down conversation with you, who obviously does a shitload of research, was one of the defining moments of my entire life. Wow, well, I am humbled. Beer me, Chris. So as we talked about in your intro, you have a pair of movies this fall, Honey Boy and Peanut Butter Falcon, both of which have considerably strong reviews with some critics calling your performances career-defining. Really? Do you see it know. that way, or are these just like the next projects to you? You're so great at this, though. You're really good at this, bro. Thank you, Zach. Yeah. Um, uh, I forgot what the question was. I was enamored with you. <laughs> what did you just ask me? Do you see these as career-defining films? Or these like the next this? projects to you? Do you do this in the mirror before we go? It doesn't look like I'm acting. <laughs> yeah. No, it just seems so prepared. Um, uh, defining. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, 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 um, maybe, yeah, sure. Yes. <laughs> so as someone who's scaled the heights of entertainment and also founded their own venture capital firm I think you're uniquely qualified to weigh in on this where are pitch meetings more likely to be parodies of themselves in Hollywood or in Silicon Valley oh that's a great question I think Silicon Valley they talk about this the elevator pitch yeah you'll literally get in an elevator and someone's like I just gotta tell you about my company I just gotta tell you about my company let me just tell you about my company I have to tell you about my company and you're like dude I'm gonna get off of this thing in like one minute so you got a minute and you've already wasted 20 seconds saying let me tell you about my, about my company you better start telling me about the company and it's usually like some guy with like a hoodie and it, I mean it's, it's, it's the tech bro it, it's the archetype that you expect and by the way like one of the best interview questions I've had in a long time yeah it's really lovely I feel like well I'm we like, still have some time to go you know I can blow here okay <laughs> feel free <laughs> No, I don't have a mustache. I don't like the how red that carpet interview. It's the most daunting assignment in all of media. There's no way to prepare yourself for everything that gets thrown at you. The speed of it, it is so fast. And then the assignment is literally trying to get a usable soundbite from someone walking by you trying to get into the party. Mm -hmm. How would you detail the ups and downs of that experience at the Met Gala where all of those knobs are cranked up to 10? You're still most well spoken. I enjoy conversation with you very much. <laughs> Thank you. You make me wish I went to more years of college so that I could be more on. Yeah, that <laughs> Just that one. Where did I go to school? Hold on. You went to school. You do your research. You say you do. I do. I do. So it was so in. Is it, it was in Texas. Yeah. Come on, go for it. It's up to your tongue. Just like this. Was it like Texas State or something? No, University of Houston. University of Houston. The Hoops. Cougars. Um, yeah. <laughs> So whenever I get asked questions about hot ones, I always find myself delivering these parables over and over, which I find when I do it, perhaps some of the nuance is lost. And you're somebody who's been doing press around TV and film for 25 years. Do you ever think about how much your narrative is shaped by the need to package the details of your life into these instantly accessible anecdotes? I, uh, a great question. I really, um, yeah, I, after a while, you get used to answering the same questions, so you just kind of think of a different way to say the same answer. And at a certain point, I don't know whether or not that is the way it happened, if that's really true, mm, or it's just I've answered perfect. that question so many times that it's now the truth or the way I feel about it. You've been upheld as a paragon of manhood in this day and age when the very tenets of masculinity are probably more hotly debated than ever. When people can survive perfectly well without knowing how to build a fire or fix a leaky faucet, what do you think is lost when people stop being him? Well, nobody told me we were going to go deep on this. Right? <laughs> I'm grateful. Uh, great question. I, um, first thing, I get accused a lot of being manly or masculine. And what, I suppose some of that must be true, but I come by it honest. It's nothing, it's what, I, it's what I was born with. I look and sound like this. But I'm 
uh, actually a very talented ballet dancer. Yes. That's dope. I feel like everybody uh, across the spectrum of sexuality should know how to use a screwdriver or should be able to change a tire. You know, things break, and those of us who know how to fix things when they break just end up being better, responsible members of our community. So over the course of your career, I know there, there are some dream gigs that got away. Yeah, Which did you well, pursue harder, car. Baywatch or Lord of the Rings? Mm. Probably Baywatch. You have a fine research department. I thought you had a great quote that was really interesting where you say, people have to try to understand that it's very weird for me to talk to people I don't know about something I care about so much. You're like a really well-researched and like great interview. This is wild. So are you. Thanks. So are you. Do you have any insight to why White Sox gear from the days of Easy e and Ice Cube to you and Kendrick Lamar, why it has such an esteemed place in hip hop? Uh, I don't know, that's a good observation. I would say it's probably the colorway the black and white over, way over like, ever feeling, you know, connected or accepted in baseball. I think it's more so a, like a rebranding of something that we find to be cool. Um, uh, why? Why? Um, why not? You're amazing at this, man. <laughs> You did a great job today, yeah. Did you have a good time? <laughs> Holy shit, dude. <laughs> I mean, no wonder this show's a hit. Aww. I mean, I legit was crying. Uh, it went just like I thought it would, except uh, your questions were, were good, were better than I thought they would be. For a, for a chicken wing YouTube show? Yeah. <laughs> you never know. Hey, you really sure, never know. Really Oh, that's cool. That's cool that they really enjoy interviewing with him because, yeah, a lot of interviews can be very basic. I'm like, oh, what were you wearing at the awards yesterday? And, oh, what'd you think about Love and Hip Hop? You know, they're going to ask you really basic shit that don't matter, that don't really have any substance. But, you know, he was digging a bit deeper, so I thought that was cool. And he did research on them as well, which kind of reminded me of Narvor. He always does, like, really extensive research on you know people who he interviews and they're always like really blown away so i love watching those videos as well maybe i need to watch hot ones but uh, they're really long though i don't like watching long ass videos i just don't if the video is over like 15 and not i'm not talking about for reactions well for reactions definitely but even on my own if the video is over like 15 minutes i'm just like eh, i don't i don't want to i don't want to uh, that's too long like give me something kind of shorter so i think that's what kind of like deters me from watching a hot ones episode but I might give it a chance in the future. We'll see. Let me know what y'all thought about the video, though. Let me know what other videos you want me to react to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!